Susan Hutchison, thank you for being here, taking part in this uh, online voter's guide. Um, let me start by asking you, what issue do you see as the most important facing the county right now? Well, it's the budget deficit, and the issue uh, comes about because we are in a very weak economy where people aren't spending money, and we get our tax receipts from uh, the sales tax. And so when people don't buy things, we have diminished revenues at the county, and therefore we have a, a deficit, and we have to cut or make changes in county government because we don't have enough money to pay for the programs that we're committed to. What's going to be your priority, if elected, in the first 100 days of office? Well, it has to be multi-pronged because uh, you, you want to increase revenues to help uh, with the budget deficit, and you also have to cut spending, which is what everybody does in their families and their businesses. So in the first 100 days and beyond, we're going to do everything we can to improve the economic environment of the county. And that really comes down to helping businesses thrive. And I've said many times that we're going to put out the open for business sign on the county because we need to show small business and large businesses that provide the jobs, that fuel the economy, that are the engine for economic growth. We have to show them that they are welcome here and, uh, and that we're going to make this a great place to do business. Uh, one of the things I've said is that I'm going to go to Olympia and advocate on the part of small business for a raising of a threshold on the B&O tax, which would remove a lot of burden on startups and small businesses uh, because, you know, that's a, a gross income tax. In other words, it's paid on income before even profits are made. And so it can be a real burden on small business. And we believe that about 50,000 small businesses can benefit benefit uh, with uh, a help in the B&O tax area. Also, uh, we've got to cut spending, and uh, there has been a tremendous amount of uh, cutting in, in the past year because of the budget deficit, uh, but it's been the cuts on law enforcement, prosecutor's office, courts. Uh, that's a real concern because that's the paramount duty of the county is to provide uh, safety and and protection to the citizens. And so where we need to cut is the, is the overgrown government that has occurred over the last decade or so. Uh, the administrative offices are, are large, the executive's office, the council office, um, all of those people get, um, have, that number of people has been growing over the, uh, the years. And so we have, to, we have to scale back, and it'll be hard. You know, nobody wants, the hardest thing you do is cut your workforce. But we've got to do that because that's what the voters and the citizens of this county expect. They want the county to live within its means, just like they have to do and just like their businesses have to do. Some of these questions may overlap a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, let's, let's talk about the budget deficit. The county's facing a $50 million deficit next year. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more uh, on how you would deal with this? Do you support a tax increase, and where would you like to see cuts? I've said from the start that a tax increase is not the answer uh, to a budget deficit. It's not the first line of defense. I think there's been enough of that over the years, and that's one of the frustrations of our voters is, you know, they're just tired of this gigantic government and the taxes they pay toward it without seeing the services uh, provided that they would expect. And so uh, we just, we can't do that. We can't raise taxes in the middle of a recession. Uh, we've got to figure out ways to cut our spending, streamline government, make uh, government more efficient, find the waste and cut it out. And you do that through performance audits. And uh, that's one of the things that has occurred recently, and a lot of people have heard about it because the state auditor conducted an audit or tried to and could not even get from the various departments and divisions of the county the information that was needed in order to complete the audit. In other words, what they saw was lack of accountability, lack of transparency, lack of best practices, all those things that we would require of any business. In fact, businesses would go out of businesses if they behaved the way uh, the county has behaved. Uh, the lack of the ability to provide data for an audit is just unconscionable. The county is a mess. And I saw this a few years ago. I was appointed by Ron Sims to, back in uh, 2005, to be on a 10-member community task force to try to restore uh, credibility to our elections division after the 2004 recounts, the gubernatorial race that was so disputed. And there were 10 of us, community leaders, and we began to look at what was going on in the elections division. And we found the exact same thing, lack of accountability, lack of transparency, lack of uh, best practices. And uh, 
And so we made a number of recommendations, uh, most of which have been implemented in the last few years, which I'm really proud about. But what we saw in that exercise was that uh, there were significant problems in county government and particularly at the executive level. And that's when I began to see that someone who, like me, who was a nonpartisan, nonpolitician, could come in with new ideas and a new direction for the county. How important is it going to be to work with unions in terms of pay, in terms of positions, benefits, to address the budget deficit? That is an excellent question. I'm the only candidate who's ever been in a union. I uh, served in a union for 25 years uh, when I was in broadcasting. And uh, so I've been actually on both sides of the bargaining table. And I know uh, how unions think and, and uh, what's important to unions. And I've, I've negotiated on behalf of my union and I've negotiated on the other side as part of management uh, in, in other capacities as chair of the board of the Seattle Symphony. So I have spent uh, many weeks since I got into this race uh, reaching out to our unions and especially union leadership that interacts with the county, that has contracts with the county. And I, I've talked with them about their issues, how they see some of the wage and benefit uh, packages that they have negotiated. I've met with the King County Labor Council and, and I've said to them, we have to solve this problem together. And, uh, and I'm reaching out to you uh, because we have to conform to the realities. We have to adjust to the realities that we're facing right now in this economic situation. The county employees have a terrific, terrific benefits package. There's no question about it. It's better than just about any governmental body anywhere uh, around. And uh, so, uh, you know, I don't blame the, the union leadership for negotiating that. That's what they're supposed to do. I put the blame squarely on the shoulders of the executive who negotiated this with the unions last year in the middle of the economic meltdown and it was signed in March of 09. And at the same time, all of us were pulling back. Companies were scaling back, they were letting go of employees, they were asking for uh, paybacks, they were, or uh, givebacks, um, they were giving furloughs to employees or, um, you know, cutting pay. And while all of this was happening, because we were all starting to see that the struggle was going to be on to survive uh, through this economic downturn, the county was negotiating this phenomenal benefits package for the unions. And it's not just the benefits, it's also the wages and the cost of living increases that go on year after year after year. Uh, when other people's pay is flat or even cut. And so we have to adjust to the economic realities that we're facing. And um, we have this structural deficit now in the county because wages are going up and revenues have been flat for some years. And so um, even without the economic downturn, we're in trouble. So this is forcing us to really assess, work closely with the unions, which I want to do, and, uh, and help to turn this around. Let's talk about public safety a little bit. Seattle and King County are both facing a, a serious gang problem. Some people have called it a pandemic. And there seem to be two schools of thought emerging. One that would treat it almost like a public health threat, like an infectious disease. Another that would call for harsher penalties and, and uh, a tough crackdown by police. Where do you land on that issue and how would you deal specifically with the gang problem? In the county, uh, especially in South County, uh, Kent, as one example, there, there is a serious gang problem. And I've met with the mayor of Kent, and we've talked about it. And uh, they're very concerned. Of course, it starts with law enforcement. And with the cuts to our, our sheriff's deputies, this is a very difficult thing. Uh, at the same time that we need more protection against gang violence, uh, we're cutting deputies throughout the county. And so that has got to stop. We need to, we need to make sure that our sheriff's department has all the resources it needs. But law enforcement, not just in the county, but in the cities, is very focused on how to provide intervention with the gangs. In other words, it's not just the punishment after the crimes are committed or the violence is committed. It's actually intervening before anything happens to provide a way out for these young people who see that gangs are their only hope. And so we need to, to change their thinking and help give them a different way to go. And that's in education and jobs and, and other intervention programs. So it's a multi-pronged effort. Law enforcement is very aware and working very hard to uh, make sure that we solve these 
problems as they come up. And, uh, and I want to work, as King County Executive, I want to give empowerment not only to, to our uh, county, but also work very closely with the city so that we can collaborate. Uh, that's the only way we can be strong. And the previous administration is known uh, throughout the county for being uh, arrogant and uh, imperial, as I've heard uh, it called by some, uh, toward the cities, uh, disdainful, disrespectful. We're going to work with all the mayors, all the leadership of the cities that uh, reside within our borders so that we can get things done and uh, get them done together. What's your vision for, uh, for transportation overall in the county, and specifically in regards to metro, light rail, and the ferries? Well, this is the biggest issue for most people in the county. They're just so frustrated. And they're, what they're frustrated about is congestion. And the fact that every time you get on the roads, every time you try to get anywhere, you get stuck in traffic. And the interesting thing is I've talked with a number of metro drivers. You wouldn't think that bus drivers would, uh, would care. But they are so frustrated because they have to be in that congestion as well. And uh, most of us can avoid it if we, if we try. Uh, to stay out of the traffic patterns. They can't. It's part of their job. And so everybody wants congestion to end. I think that the transportation policy of the last 20 years has been uh, a day late and a dollar short. And now we're spending a great deal of money on light rail. Uh, I think it should have occurred 20 years ago. I think light rail is terrific in major cities around the country and throughout Europe. We've all ridden on it and uh, know that it gets you places predictably uh, and at a low expense and without getting caught in traffic. Um, so light rail is very much a part of our future, but it's very expensive. And uh, so, of course, we focus on metro transit, which is our buses. And then we also have to look at a, a comprehensive policy that integrates all these systems. There tends to be a what they call the modal wars. You know, are you pro-bus or are you pro-light rail or are you pro cars and roads and what we have to do is integrate the whole system to solve the problem and what I've seen and what I think our voters have seen over the years is political solutions oh we'll satisfy this political constituency or that constituency instead of saying how do we solve the congestion east to west between Bellevue and the east side and Seattle with all the people that are commuting both directions trying to get to their jobs and get home at night we need to make uh, this area more livable by being able to get around, but we also need to support our businesses that require freight be moved in an expedited manner. And uh, that means the freight that comes in in our ports or comes out of our distribution centers down in Auburn and Kent, uh, all of that has to get on the roads or get on heavy rail and move throughout the county, throughout the region, and, and then the rest of the world. So we have to work together to, to solve this problem. And one of the things that I am talking about is appointing someone in a leadership role, not a bureaucratic role, in the county to be like a transportation czar uh, that oversees our transportation policy in the county, works with the other counties, works with the state. And again, not a bureaucrat, but someone who has the leadership capability to get things done. Uh, former King County Executive Ron Sims launched the, the Smart Growth Initiative to end sprawl and to manage the fast-paced growth um, by encouraging growth in the, in the urban growth area. How do you propose to handle continued growth in the county? Well, the urban growth boundaries are, are very useful, and I, I think everybody is learning to see the future uh, through uh, building density in our city centers and infrastructure to serve that density. I am concerned about people who live in East King County and want to preserve the rural uh, life that, that they have chosen. Um, but it's been very difficult on them with the, with the um, critical areas ordinance, which has now been deemed, most of it has been deemed unconstitutional, uh, because it was the taking of land from, from landowners uh, without just compensation. And so you find that there are farmers who have farmed land for, for decades, uh, multiple generations, and suddenly they were unable to use the land as they always had. We have, to, we have to have a responsible environmental policy, no doubt about it. But at the same time, we have to recognize for the people that live in our rural areas and provide that wonderful aspect of our county that if we continue at the rate we're going, the rural areas of our county will be for the wealthy, retired, who can afford to buy multiple acres and, and, uh, and 
enjoy them by themselves. We, we want uh, farmable land. We want pastures. We want uh, dairies. We want all those things that, that you have in, rural, in our rural environment. And so I want to work with the people in East King County who are uh, standing firm on their land and really angry with the county. Tremendous anger with the way that they've been treated. And again, that arrogance, disdain, imperial attitude out of a very Seattle-centric government. You know, it's located right in downtown Seattle. And so it tends not, our county government tends not to uh, you know, have a, a focus on on the greater county, which is a much higher population than even in the city of Seattle. So I want to be a county executive that serves the whole county. And, uh, and we can bring all the stakeholders together at the table, the environmentalists and the landowners and the, the, the pro-growth and the anti-growth. Everybody can be at the table and we can talk things out and find the ways to move ahead so that we make this county the best place to live and work. What's the, uh, what do you see as the county's role in fighting global warming and climate change? Well, I think that uh, under the previous administration, there's been a great deal of focus on that. Um, also at the state level, we will certainly comply with all the laws and regulations uh, that uh, the state has imposed. And, uh, and we will be a county that is known for caring about our, our, our air and our water and our mountains and our forests. At the same time, uh, we want strong environmental policy that's based on science. I, I say we have to have people whose hearts are in the right place, but their heads have to be in the right place as well. This, is, this cannot be an emotionally driven uh, policy effort. We have to do good thinking. And, uh, and I, I have a, a sort of a funny story, and it, it's just one little tale of, uh, uh, of an environmental effort that went awry. Um, uh, people who have acreage near Carnation uh, farmed by the family for three generations. The fellow who owns it now or you know is the grandson of the original owners. He grew up there. He knows the property very well. The county comes and says we need to plant willow trees along your stream so that it can protect the fish and they need the shade. And he said well it'll be great for the fish but it'll be better for the beavers. So uh, certainly uh, indeed the the uh, willows went in. The beavers came and, and chopped them down and got the branches and made beautiful dams on a stream that had not had dams before. It flooded this winter because of those dams. Uh, by May, the pasture land still had not dried out. And, uh, and so this was policy gone awry. The, the county had to come back and dig up the willows. You know, I don't know what it cost the county, but I think that if they had sat down with the landowner and said, we want to provide more shade, uh, what do you think would work? That landowner would have said, don't put in willows because the beavers will come. And, uh, and that's the kind of, we have to be common sense when it comes to our environmental policies. And that's what, and we need to listen to the experts. The fellow who lives on that land and has all his life knows a lot. And we need to listen to the people who um, know the land and care about it and want to preserve it and not just have government bureaucracy bureaucrats come in and say, well, this is what's going to happen here. Um, last question, your turn. Is there any issue that we haven't talked about that you'd like to talk about or anything that we have that you'd like to elaborate a little more on? Well, I just think that it's important. Our voters decided in November that this was to be a nonpartisan race because the county issues don't have a D or an R next to them. They're services that are provided to the people. And the only way that we can we can make sure that we continue to do the best job that we can is to bring people together from uh, from from all political perspectives and work together to get things done and that's what I've done in the community these some thir almost 30 years that I've lived in the Seattle area um, you know it's a great thing to meet with and work alongside these amazing citizens that are so dedicated to keeping the Puget Sound region what it is and we love it, and, um, and we want to work for it, and we want to make it a better place for our children and their children. But the only way we can do that is to get rid of this divisive political environment that we are in, bring people together, work together to solve our complex problems, and that's what I want to do. Susan Hutchison, thank you very much. Thank you, Ethan.